Welcome to the final episode of Solace Sessions. We'd just like to thank you all for tuning in each week. We'd like to thank you for your support and in particular to the writers and the actors that have come on board to support us in this programme. Thank you so much and enjoy the final night of Solace Sessions. I loved to visit Grandma when I was just a child. I played with Cousin Tommy. That Mammy said was wild. Grandma had lots of dishes of which she was quite proud. To touch these precious vessels, no children were allowed. In a glass case in the parlour were the ones she kept for best and on the kitchen dresser she showed off all the rest. One day, Tommy knocked a dish onto the kitchen floor. When Grandma saw the pieces, she gave out an awful roar. She was sad and very angry as she shouted at the lad. She said she didn't love him because he did something bad. Years passed and Tom got married and she left him the place. His young, sophisticated wife threw out the good glass case. Grandma's no longer with us, and Tommy died last year. The house is now a ruin, and greatly changed, I fear. The new house is all modern and fit for king and queen. In the kitchen there's a unit, but no dresser to be seen. The parlour and its contents were discarded with derision. In the corner, there's a picture box known as a television. It shows images beamed into it through a big ugly dish with news and other programmes from any place you wish. The ugly things are like a rash on many a roof and gable. Some folk eat meals off a tray and seldom use a table. Grandma's dishes are gone now, where all good dishes go. She did not live to see the day. She was spared that woe.
This is about what I make. Not the gold, but the schmempty. My world is sick and I make the gold. And they say my world is virtue when I make schmempty. I sit in a room, medium room, a restaurant. I wait for my lady friend, the lady friend I love. But I don't know her very much. I look at the sea, a county, another county, my county, three counties in view. <laughs> the waves refuse to stop. My head uh, begins to ache, aching waves, unstopping it, mm. unstopping waves, aching head. I feel almost loved. And that goes away. Then I rethink. I feel almost dismissed. Mm. And that stays almost dismissed. For having my very own the gold. For having my very own the palette. For having my very own the something unstable and terrible. Something that worked once upon a time, but today it's. Schmenty. That's what they say. The waves refuse to stop. Mm, my head continues to ache. Why? <sighs> Who knows? Aching waves. Unstopping head. Mm. Unstopping waves. Aching head. A police car that seems almost vacant in the back. Everyone is behaving. I don't know. I don't care. I take a deep breath in. Well, it makes me feel something stronger. I feel hatred for those who don't understand, and I feel disregard for those who pretend they do. I resolve that life me owes something. <laughs> that life me must something. I rethink. Oh, uh, the medium room in the restaurant. She meets me, the lady friend. I don't want to pay. It's expensive and I don't want to pay. She wants to leave? Well, the waves refuse to stop, but I pray that they stop for the sake of the ache in my head. Mmm, unaching waves, stopping head, un stopping aching, aching head, unstopping waves. I can't pay for the meal. My meal. Her meal. I mean, I could. But I can't. I really think. Um, my makings are schmempty. I have no gold. We leave without paying because everyone else is behaving and I leave her because I don't love her very much. I love her. But not very much. Her makings schmempty. Although sometimes the gold but usually schmempty. No. But I shouldn't say a word. I shouldn't say anything. Or, I should just say what is real. The waves. The waves who refuse to stop. But I pray that they stop for the sake of the ache in my head. Unstopping waves, aching head. I pray that the big blue waves stop. <laughs> There's no point in telling you. The waves refuse to stop. The big blue waves refuse to stop. Stopping waves, aching head. Oh, so I tell you that I made the waves little and pink. That I made the waves little and pink. Um, don't look. They're not little and pink. But, but hey, look at me. They're pink and little. <laughs> gold. Oh, the waves aren't gold. The waves are pink. But the notion is gold. The gold. Someone will like it. Maybe one person, maybe just me, but that's good enough. And what do we get from the little pink waves? Do we get gold? Do we get food? Do we get cloth? Do we get bricks? Do we get wine? Do we get gold, 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 gold? I tell them that the waves are small and pink, and they say no. And they're right. They say, that's not gold. I say, no. That's pink.
never turn that lawnmower off. He's out there all hours. Oh, if only we could go to the co-op. They say it'll be open next week. I'm going to get Dad to go. I need some compost. Will we ever get this house finished? There's always something. Never buy an old house. Do you know if the babies are coming by the garden today? Oh, no, sure, Dara's working. He has to wear that mask for 12 hours. Oh, God love him, killing himself. At least he has a lovely home to go home to. Oh, Judith is walking again. God, she's great. We should go walking. Cooped up in this house is no good. And we haven't been to Siobhan's grave in weeks. The last time I was down there, I said I was going to get one of those cherubs. You know, Mammy and Daddy have one on theirs. We must pot some nice plants. Herbs, maybe. She would like that. Our poor Siobhan. When I think of Emmet up there now, in that empty house, I know Siobhan. I'd have driven up to Galway only for this. Did I ever tell you about the time that I drove up to see her? I hadn't seen her in a good while, so I made her some of that spelt bread that she likes. We were going to go to a special mass in the cathedral. Oh, and the weather was brutal that day. Brutal. Siobhan drove over and met in the car park. She hopped in beside me because we were early and the door was still locked. Didn't we have a laugh that day? We had a picnic in the car. We had some of the spelt and Siobhan had snacks in her bag as usual. <laughs> I had brought a bit of coffee with me in a flask. Sure, didn't we have that too? We forgot completely about the mass and only noticed when we caught people coming out. Oh my God. We were in that car for hours. When she asked about you, and I told her you were doing great. That you loved your course. You loved your housemates. I didn't tell her that you weren't going to class. That you wouldn't leave your room. I didn't tell her that you were drinking yourself to death. I didn't tell her that you wouldn't see me. All those times I drove up. I know you're drinking. I found a bottle the other day. I can't have you in this house drinking yourself to death again. I want to tell your father. Lord knows I can't. You know his blood pressure is high. And the doctor says he has a weak heart. I know you were affected by things when you were young. Seeing Nathan drink. And losing Trevor. Well, they would be heartbroken to see the way you're going on now. I'm telling you, I'm going to get rid of all the drink in this house. And there won't be another bottle to be found. Not one. That's the only way. And Lauren wants you over. You could social distance in the garden. And spend some time together. She told me that you won't answer her messages. Now, is that any way to be going on? Your sister 
is terrified that you're going to do something. You can't keep everything cooped up inside like you did before. You need to speak to someone. Judith knows a good therapist. You can talk over the phone or do a Skype. I'm going to book you in for a call. And I don't want to hear no. I know Brian had a new baby with that young one recently. It's not easy to hear things like that. But you have to move on with your life. Who knows how long this is going to go on for? Father John was saying that we have to get out and get as much fresh air as we can. Come on! I want to get out before we meet Maggie. She's only going to be talking about her migraines again. Hello, it's great to be here. I nearly didn't make it today because of my depression. I'm thrilled to be able to read an extract from my latest book for you all today. Now, it's part autobiographical and part based on fiction and really, it's a follow up to my first book. It's not you, it's my mother. And I think that anyone who's ever had, been or met a mother or indeed a father, son or daughter, can relate to what lies within these pages. <laughs> it might make an excellent stock and filler. So, without further ado, I'd like to read an extract from my latest book for you all. It's called Womb for One More. <clears throat> it was four o'clock by the time the afternoon came round and I decided to go to Mother's. As I approached the house, I could see her large melon-shaped head peering out from behind the front door. You're late, she cried, gesturing wildly with her hands, so much so that they resembled two pancakes mid-toss. Now, it was pissing down and I was not in the mood she knew I was going to be late because I told her, but sure nothing ever goes into that melon-shaped head of hers. We sat in our usual places in the living room. I'm on the blood type diet, she announced. And I thought to myself, uh-huh. And what's the dietary requirement for a cold-blooded hag such as yourself? Magnum ice creams? but I didn't say it out loud. She slumped back in her chair like a tired old lion. In Uggs. I got up and I opened a can of rice pudding and I tried not to think about my depression. I asked her if she'd a separate recycling bin to put the can in. She called me a hippie and lit up a fag. I put a lot of things in the bin that day. 
metaphorically and for real because it was bin day. She picked up a clay pig from the Ikea Billy bookcase. All of this will be yours one day when I'm dead, she announced. Mother, please, I don't like to think about such things. Well, it's true, isn't it? I mean, we're not Egyptian. I won't be buried with it. I know we're not Egyptian, but still, so morbid. We sat in silence for a bit, and I fantasised about a giant fireball surging its way through the room and obliterating all of the clay pigs and crucifixes in its red-hot path. <laughs> we watched a repeat of eggheads. Thank you very much. Not until the break of day. I've realised there's a block of time that seems to bother me the most. The block from when we sleep to when we wake. The break of day is the one time that you are truly alone with your thoughts but cannot control what you think. Books of motivation and anxiety will say Analyzing is paralyzing. But how can we stop it? I think of why and how my brain becomes so self consumed with ideologies of new beginnings and losses of endings. And I think surely everybody is the same. Now, I'm not a crier, but there have been exactly three times in my life. When I've cried myself to sleep. The first was when my hamster died. I was eight years old and the little bastard had bitten me the week before. I named him Wilbur, like the pig from Charlotte's Web. And yes, like most children, once I saw that film, I swore never to eat meat again and never to kill another spider. To this day, I have my full Irish breakfast every Saturday morning. It takes me maximum of three seconds upon seeing a spider on the bedroom floor before I'm shouting for my dad to come in and kill it for me. The second time was when my grandfather died. I was 12 and confused about the pain I was feeling. The first familial laughs in my life. Life seems invincible when you're 12. Death doesn't even enter your mind. I mean, the literal thing I cared most about was whether people were Team Edward or Team Jacob. The third time was when my brother got engaged. It represented the loss of a relationship that became more harrowing because the physical statue was still there. It was the motion towards a new beginning 
that didn't upset me in particular, but my father. When that phone call came through, there was a range of emotions, from cries of the utmost joy to the harrows of realisation. There are some relationships in life that are so persistent that replacing them is unbearable. But life does change. When that phone call ceased, my eyes wandered to my father, where I noticed a shiver coming from his left cheek and his eyes began to quiver. I realised this was the first time I had ever seen my father cry. With a wipe of his left cheek, with his cotton handkerchief, he simply said, I miss him, that's all. As I slept, whimpering to myself that night, I wondered what was my father's sleeping mind thinking. Then I had a realisation. We take a lot from our parents without ever noticing. I mean, we love them and feel we care, but the reality is life moves on and people become disconnected, even if they don't want to be. When we woke up the next day, the feelings of that night had stopped and I had a newfound respect and admiration for my father. But I still fear because I do know that someday I could love someone more than I love him. A deeper analysis came into play after that night. And I fear because I'm consumed by the changes that are happening and I don't know if I can prevent anything from happening in my life or I don't know how to go without hurting people. The truth is, I haven't cried since that night and it worries me to think about when I will again. Tough stuff. I can't go beat the shit out of him, and I certainly can't go beat the shit out of her. So, I decide to go beat the shit out of the ocean instead. Come on, so, it shouts at me, thumping its chest. But, as we all know, the worst kind of person to taunt is the person who is prepared to die, and I am. I am bloody well prepared to die. So I kick off my shoes, trousers, socks, and run into it. And it thumps me, but I thump it back. It grabs my balls and puts me into a headlock and pulls my hair until we're both out of breath. And we walk to the shore together, our arms around one another. And it says to me, you're made of tough stuff, man. You're made of tough stuff.
My first memory of Uncle Fred comes from when I was about seven years old. He was my Aunt Maura's husband. She had met him when she was nursing in England during the Second World War. He was a major in the British Army. He spoke with a perfect BBC accent and used words that we never heard of before. He and my aunt used to call each other darling and they drank gin and tonics. They had their dinner in the evening and lunch in the middle of the day. But when they came to stay with our grandmother during the summer holidays, that was the highlight of our year. Their daughter, Anne, she was an only child. She always wore beautiful clothes. Whereas we had to make do with clothes from American parcels. Sometimes didn't fit properly. Anne led a very sheltered life though. And we took great pleasure in showing her how to jump bog holes and climb apple trees. In turn, she would tell us stories from books and the television. All about Sooty and the escapades of the famous five. Mm. Uncle Fred never came empty-handed. He would bring uh, surplus army boots for my father and brothers. They were never meant to be used walking on the west of Ireland farm. We kids were kept supplied with orangeade and lemonade. We mixed it with ice-cold water from our spring well. It tasted absolutely delicious. He brought bottles of cod liver oil as well which my brothers and sister detested. But I, for some reason, loved the taste of it. Now, Uncle Fred, he was a great cook. We were used to bacon and cabbage, but his favourite dinner was roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. There was great care taken choosing that beef. The poor butcher, he was questioned about how long it had been hanging and told if it wasn't very, very tender, he would get some ear bashing on Fred's next visit. But the piece de resistance was the Yorkshire pudding. Now, pudding was something we ate after the dinner. But this is something you ate with the dinner. One summer's day, I remember our grandmother's neighbour, his name was Patrick. He was with us because he was help saving the hay. Well, I'll never forget the look of astonishment on his face when Fred, who was doing the cooking, asked, Patrick, are you for Yorkshire? The poor man. I think he thought he was being conscripted into the British Army. <laughs> oh, Uncle Fred would always bring us to Galway as a special treat. Woolworths, that was our favourite shop. We saved our pennies for weeks beforehand. Now we girls would head straight to the counter with the hairpins and bobbins and the lads would make a beeline for the cowboy hats and pop guns. And then Uncle Fred would treat each of us to a quarter of sweets from the selection on that big display counter over there. Oh, it was a hard decision choosing. My taste buds got relished with the taste of Scots clan, iced caramel, and my very favourite, bonbons, covered in powdery sugar that would leave a sticky coating on your fingers. Oh, I loved to lick it off when all the sweets were gone. Now, that was a far cry from the penny toffees that we were used to. Uncle Fred, well, he loved dogs. He bred dogs. They were whippets. Now, that's a breed we'd never heard of before. He gave my parents one once. It was called Mary. Mary came with her own papers to say who her parents were. Our poor dogs didn't have any of those credentials. And even if they had done, I'm sure they would have said, Father unknown. <laughs> Later on, when I got married, he gave me a beautiful puppy. Cinders. She was a much loved member of our family. She was with us for 16 years. Being in the army, you know, Fred and the family were moved about a lot. We used to envy Anne her lifestyle. But looking back on it, I'd say she envied us ours. They were stationed in Germany for a while. 
Then, in Agabe, in Jordan, a big crisis broke out over the Suez Canal and the families of the soldiers were all evacuated back to England. My aunt and cousin came to stay with our grandmother. That was a very anxious time for them. Aunt Maura, she listened to the BBC World Service every day to see what was happening. There were very few phones back then, except for the priest and the doctor, and all the messages came from the post office. Then one day, the World Service announced that a plane that was carrying a load of British soldiers back to England had been blown up on the tarmac. That was the same day that Uncle Fred was due to come home. All the family gathered in grandmother's house, listening for any news of Fred. They spoke in hushed tones so as not to alarm the children, especially poor Anne. But we were playing outside. We didn't really know what was happening. We could hear the hushed tones on the world service. They were talking about what was happening in a land so far away from our secure place in the west of Ireland. Then the word came that Fred was safe. But still, poor Aunt Mara. She was very sad. She knew a lot of those soldiers who were killed. She was very close to their wives. Well, then as the years went by, we stopped going to Galway and the seaside. We were far too sophisticated to be going to get hair slides and cowboy hats. We were busy listening to Elvis and the Beatles on our transistor radio. But we still looked forward to Uncle Fred and the family visits every summer. But during this time, the troubles broke out up in the north of Ireland and Fred and the family were sent there. He had to be careful now in his visits to us because feelings were running very high against British soldiers. But to us, he was still Uncle Fred, who we loved dearly and we loved his BBC accent. <laughs> but he still had to be wary because to others, he was a British soldier. Poor Aunt Mara. She died in the 1970s. She donated her body to medical research. Now that was a really uncommon thing in Ireland then. My mother, like the rest of the family, was totally heartbroken and couldn't grieve, she said, until she had a grave to visit. But then she herself died before Aunt Maura's body was released. Well then, Uncle Fred, Later, he remarried, he retired from the army, so we didn't see as much from then. He died in the 1980s. But I'll never forget his kindness to us children and the look of astonishment on our neighbour's face when he said, Are you for Yorkshire, Patrick? <laughs>